Hello, everybody. Um, before we get started, I would like to acknowledge first and foremost the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation, who are the traditional custodians of the lands from which we are speaking to you tonight. I'd like to pay my respects to elders past and present and to thank them for their continued hospitality on this land that was taken without consent. Recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander sovereignty is uh, long overdue. And this recognition is also essential in um, dismantling the shameful colonial legacy of the state that we call Australia. My name is Jennifer Down and I um, have the pleasure of facilitating the Toolkits Fiction Program this year. Um, tonight I also have the pleasure of being joined by the amazing Elizabeth Tan. Um, she is the author of short story collection Smart Ovens for Lonely People. Um, which won the 2020 Readings Prize for New Australian Fiction and was also longlisted for the 2021 Stella Prize. Her first book was the novel and stories titled Rubik, which came out in 2017. I've just explained to Elizabeth that I don't have it with me because it's <laughs> currently on loan to a friend. Otherwise, I would do another <clears throat> Vanna White <laughs> Um, both of those books are published through Brio if you are looking for them. Elizabeth lives in Perth on Wajaf Noongar land um, and it is a delight to be able to get together this evening for our final Toolkits Live broadcast of this year. So thank you for joining us, Elizabeth. Thanks for having me. Um, before we get started with what I'm sure will be a lovely conversation, got to get through that housekeeping up top. Um, so Toolkits is an intensive 12 week course for writers under 30 to develop their skills in a unique digitally based environment. I've come back for five years now, I think. I don't want to count actually, but you know, the passage of time. Um, but one of the reasons I think this is such a great program is that it's not limited to people who live on the East Coast of Australia or within easy traveling distance to a, a major you know, capital city where there's arts infrastructure or, um, or to people who have heaps of money. Um, we were actually online long before the pandemic, which means that, um, yeah, since the start of the program, any young writers have been able to participate, regardless of their geographic uh, mobility or financial circumstances. Um, for this, we have to thank the copyright agency Cultural Fund, um, who support toolkits. Um, and the program itself is run by Express Media. Um, if Express Media was a person, they'd be too old to submit to VoiceWorks by now. That's how long we've been on. <laughs> Um, the, third, the third decade, they might be older than me. Um, this whole time they've been supporting and uh, promoting young writers through workshops that develop skills, through opportunities for uh, constructive feedback and publication like VoiceWorks, which I can see Elizabeth has in the background there. Um, and it's a really old been... issue. <laughs> it's so vintage. Okay, that, I, that, I feel like that um, typeface is like my vintage maybe. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, what I used to. Anyway, um, <laughs> VoiceWorks also offers a number of programs and awards that recognise excellence in young writers. So over the last few months, we have enjoyed a live se season, rather, or not session, a live season of broadcasts for anybody to tune into each fortnight from our fiction, non-fiction and our, our graphic nar narratives programs. And this evening is actually our final broadcast. But if you missed any of the previous ones, including last night's nonfiction uh, broadcast with Stephen Pham and Cher Tan, which was about structure in nonfiction. Um, have no fear, all of them are available on, available on YouTube for you to enjoy at your leisure um, and will be captioned in the coming days, if not already. And last but not least, we welcome questions. We love them. Otherwise, it's just me asking the questions that I've thought of. And my brain isn't working very well today because... <laughs> of lockdown and other reasons. So hit me with them. Um, you can submit them on Twitter using the hashtag EM Toolkits. That's the letters EM Toolkits. Uh, or via the live chat session just under the video on YouTube. We will uh, get to them. So I titled this week's session This Writing Life, which sounds really broad and maybe it is, but um, we've spent the last 12 or most of the last 12 weeks talking a lot about like elements of craft things like dialogue and uh, setting and characterization. And all of that is really important, but um, I also wanted to make sure we got time to speak about what it means to kind of pursue writing professionally, whether it's your whole career um, or not. 
and and spoiler alert for for most of us it won't ever be your whole career um i think i know maybe two or, i don't know maybe elizabeth has a different view on this i'm keen to hear but i think i personally know maybe to maybe three authors who who write full time for a living, as in make a living from their creative writing practice. Um, and what is fun about that is that you, even if you have a book published and maybe even a successful book that has won an award or two, um, you'll probably still get to explain to like uncles and co-workers for years to come um, why you are doing a waitressing job. Um, because they're always like, why can't you, you know, why don't you just write something like JK Rowling? Um, <laughs> anyway, sorry for that preamble. I definitely have a lockdown gremlin inside of me. So I no, apologize. No, that's okay. Preamble's that good. <laughs> okay. um, I guess just to get us started, I wanted to, this is a general question, but I wondered, Elizabeth, if you could talk a little bit about your road to publication, to, to book publication. How did, um, how did Rubik, for instance, come into being as your first book? Yep. Um, so Rubik was um, the creative component of my PhD um, and so I finished that in 2015. Um, I kind of had three attempts um, to try and find a publisher for Rubik but actually I think the story of how Rubik came to be published is probably more accurately uh, the story of how I came to find my editor um, Alice Grundy who I worked with um, on Rubik and my second book Smart Ovens mm -hmm. for Lonely People. Um, so I, um, so the third thing that I tried for Rubik was that I submitted to Giramondo and it was an unsolicited submission. So I went through their submittable portal and, um, in, um, at that time they asked for a synopsis and three chapters, which I think is quite typical of many publishers. Um, so, um, yeah, I sent that through to Giramondo in about, um, I think November 2015, um, mm. and that's how it came across Alice's desk. Um, she was managing editor at Giramondo at the time. Um, I think many people on this broadcast have an appreciation of how slowly um, publishing can move. So um, it was um, about six months after that that Alice was was able to um, make an offer on my manuscript um so there were a few kind of waiting periods so there was that first little waiting period of um my initial submission being um read by Alice and then her requesting um the full manuscript and then a little wait after that um so um Sorry, <laughs> it was it was a while ago, so like I have to kind of remember the 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 whole story. Um, so um, the I guess the slightly unusual thing about how I came to be published was that um, in that kind of six month kind of waiting time, um, Alice actually um, accepted a new role at another publisher, um, which was at that point known as. Zoom, spelled X-O-U-M, not to be confused with the other Zoom that we're all too familiar with now, um, and is now known as Brio. Um, they were starting a new literary imprint. Um, and so uh, with, with Giramondo's blessing, Alice was able to take the projects that she was working on um, at Giramondo to the new publisher. So it was just a really good stroke of timing um, on my part because if, yeah, if I delayed it, I might have, yeah, not had the opportunity to work with Alice yeah. <laughs> Can you, sorry, just going back, I, people may know, may know what this means, but um, if I was a publishing or, or writing uh, neophyte, what, what is an unsolicited submission versus a solicited submission? Okay. So um, an unsolicited submission means that um, you're, um, you're kind of, yeah, you're, you go into the publisher's website and they um, they might not be open to unsolicited submissions all year round. Um, and yeah, you read their guidelines and then you you put in your you put in your um, yeah your submission. A solicited a solicited submission is um, if you are approached by an editor, um, which is what actually happened to me. That was one of my first kind of attempts to. Um, yeah, to, to get Rubik published. Um, there was a, a short story competition that um, I, I had a story shortlisted in and one of the judges of that competition um, was an editor for a publisher and 
he generously reached out to me and was like, I really enjoyed your short story. Um, um, let me know if you have, if you ever have a full manuscript. And so when I did have a full manuscript, I did send it um, to him. Unfortunately, it wasn't a good fit for the publisher he was at at the time. Um, but yeah, that that's another way you can get published, I guess. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. an important one. And I think it's good to, it's good to think about those sort of um, distinctions. In Like Australia, we're kind of, uh, look, there are many problems with our publishing industry, which, which you know, we, we don't have time or, or the scope to, to go into here tonight. But um, one of the really kind of good things about it for writers is that it's slightly more, I don't want to say democratic, but there's a little bit less, um, at that first stage of submissions, there's a little bit less kind of gatekeeping, I suppose, compared to, say, the United States, which also, like, um, it's just a different market. This isn't me having a go. But a lot of the time, most publishing houses in the US don't accept unsolicited submissions at all. So you typically have to be introduced effectively mm. through an agent or maybe yeah. another author or someone like that. And we don't tend to have that that same structure in Australia. And so certainly not it's not perfect, but um, it, it means that anyone can, you know, at many publishing houses, there is at least, you know, one period per year or per um quarter do we use that outside financial one one financial <laughs> quarter where you can um you can submit your manuscript as a as a lay person who doesn't have an agent and um like I don't have an agent for the record I don't know if you do Elizabeth um uh, no I don't yeah it's it's a lot less yeah. I can't remember this, I I did read some stats on it recently but it's a lot less common I think less than half of Australian authors are agented compared to the states where like it's almost, I mean, I, I, yeah, it's almost impossible to to work yeah. or to be published over there with that one. So, mm, yeah, actually, um, while I don't have an agent at the moment, I have worked with an agent before. Um, mm. when my when Rubik was being um, was trying to find a a US publisher, um, there was an agent that um, was working with my publisher to help make that happen. So, um, but yeah, it it would have been impossible, yeah, without. Without yeah, <laughs> I think um, I guess agents is kind of a, a separate conversation as well. But I think they can definitely be really helpful in um, in certain situations. I, I personally have have managed uh, by virtue of a number of factors, um, namely my, my publisher and like my my I guess my comfort in my relationship with my security that I have in, in our um, our relationship. But certainly they can be a really great option. And I think for overseas, like, like what you're talking about, if you're an Australian author and um, you're looking to kind of access another market, whether it's, you know, UK or the US, France, Canada, um, mm. I think it can be really helpful to have someone on the ground who kind of knows the industry a bit better. Yeah. Assuming, yeah, assuming you're not like a, a native to whatever publishing industry it is. That's right, yeah. Um, and maybe is it right if I ask you how you came to be published? Yeah, so my experience was more like um, your short story um, example. I, <laughs> I, I guess I, I feel like my experience was quite conventional, but I, I have like I have no pitch privilege where I <laughs> never really mm -hmm. had to shop around my novel because um, I was fortunate that I submitted my first novel to. Um, the Victorian Premier's Award for an Unpublished Manuscript, which is a really great award. Many, many of the states, not all, but many of the states and territories have a similar award and they've produced some really great writers and books. Um, mm. And so I submitted to that in 2014. And at that time, like, I don't, maybe this sounds disingenuous, but I wasn't kind of, I don't know that I would have shopped my manuscript around. I don't know that I necessarily had like the confidence or the fortitude and I was never hell bent on being or like getting into publishing I suppose, or getting into authoring. Um, and so I kind of submitted it because I didn't know what else to, to do with this finished manuscript. <laughs> I think I just wanted to like see if maybe it had legs, you know. Um, yeah. And it didn't, it didn't win but it was shortlisted and that was enough to um, – I think like in the previous year or perhaps the year before that, like Maxine Benneber Clark had won the prize um, and it had had a couple of other really successful, um, you know, like people who had written really, who'd gone on to sell a lot of books and things like that. And I think um, that kind of generated some interest in it from publishers. Um, and I, I talked with a couple of publishers and then it was just a matter of, um, of finding the, the publisher and the editor who felt like the right fit and there were kind of a couple who immediately whether it was them or I was thinking this 
I think there were, there were a few who kind of asked to read the full manuscript and then were like, oh, oh this isn't for us. And there are a few who read it and um, I, I had met with them or spoke with them and I was like, oh, I don't, I don't, I don't know if I feel comfortable about what, you know, I don't know if I, mm. I, I don't know, it sounds awful, but you really want to trust the person. Like for sure. Alice, you want to really trust that they, um, they want what is best, that you have the same vision, I guess, for your book. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. I mean, I've had that, I mean, when I look back on like the attempts that didn't work out for Rubik, um, like I don't feel any bitterness or ill feeling about that at all because I mean, oh, totally. those kind of, yeah, those opportunities that didn't work out, it led me to working with someone who was really passionate about the manuscript exactly. and ha has been a champion of my work. Um, yeah. For as long as I've been a, yeah, as <laughs> long as I've been writing books. So yeah. yeah. I, I mean, sorry, I don't, I don't know her personally. I shouldn't say that, but <laughs> I, I she's such a, an amazing and dynamic figure within the Australian publishing industry and particularly um, among uh, a set that like uh, among books that are really kind of doing something different or interesting that like mainstream Australian publishing has traditionally uh, issued or, or not paid as much attention to. And I think that's like so cool and so important because <laughs> the, the more kind of, I don't know, the greater the plurality of, of formats and ways to tell stories and uh voices I, I like that can only be a, a good thing I think yeah for sure thank you Alice if you're watching <laughs> <laughs> um no I, I again so I feel weird because we've never met but I've only ever heard wonderful okay. things about her and you know you just you follow what somebody does or you see the kinds yeah. of books that they're publishing and you're like <laughs> cool person um we have a question yeah. from Lisa should young fiction writers be writing for the Australian market or would it be better to write for the American market and try to get published there first. Oh, that's interesting, isn't it? Um, you know what I can say, maybe while you're having a think, I don't mm -hmm. know that I really have a strong opinion on this, but Kavita Bedford, who joined us for our first uh, live broadcast, which you can rewatch um, on, <laughs> on, on the YouTube, um, she mentioned that she actually had some difficulty finding an Australian publisher for her book friends in dark shapes it's behind me i'm not going to reach for it because <laughs> i don't know see too much of me um but she mentioned that she actually came to her australian publisher uh text via um or, or after having had her book acquired by a u.s publisher um and so and she always she said she'd always had better luck i guess with you know journals and things in the united states even though like friends in dark shapes is I don't know if you've read it, Elizabeth. It's set in Sydney and it's very, like... It's very uh, Australian. Yeah, very Australian. So I, I was really fascinated by that because mm, I... That's um, interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's definitely, like, it's totally different from my experience, but it did make me think a little bit more about... You know, it's a very small market here, so... Mm, yeah. I... Honestly, I think when I set out to write stuff, I, I don't know if I pay attention very much to to the market, I guess, like I, I'm writing whatever I, I want to write. Um, and I, th I think like both of my books are like quite unapologetically set in, in this country. Um, and yeah, I'm not, that doesn't really answer the, qu the question, but. Um, no, I, um, I think, I don't know. It's, I think it also maybe, I'm not an expert in this, so I'm, that's why I'm kind of hedging mm. here. But I think it also can depend on genre. I and I'm mm. sorry, it's entirely anecdotal and based on conversations with other writers. I think if you're writing, um, I don't know, I don't like the term literary fiction, but let's say non-genre fiction or genre agnostic fiction. Um, I think I don't know that we need to come up with a, be a better phrase for it because I, I don't like <laughs> the idea of like you know highfalutin fiction, but. Um, I think there's a really strong market for that in Australia and, and a relatively wide demographic. We have a small readership generally, but they do tend to read, um, you know, not hyper literary stuff, but they tend to read fiction generally. I think what I've heard, and I say this as somebody who doesn't work in these genres, but from people who write science fiction and fantasy and probably other genres that I'm, I'm leaving mm. out, um, I have heard anecdotally that they've had better luck um mm, in the US because I think I think 
my understanding is that because there's just a bigger, I mean, it's a bigger readership, bigger audience over there and where, I don't know, it always feels like fantasy is this huge market, but mm, I guess yeah. adult fantasy perhaps is a relatively narrow sliver of Australian adult readers, whereas in the US it may still be a narrow sliver, but there, it's, so it's a larger sliver. Of- <laughs> exactly, exactly. So I, yeah. I have heard that anecdotally, but I hmm. yeah, no experience to back it up. Yeah, that kind of makes sense because um, I was thinking because um, uh, Rubik um, was picked up by an Amer- by a US publisher reasonably quickly. Um, like I, I don't know whether it's because I just wasn't privy to all the rejections and stuff like that, but um, it it felt a lot easier um, at the moment. Um, Smart Ovens is um, you know it hasn't found a, a US publisher, and um, I have been a bit more privy to um, the agent that I've been working with. Um, she very kindly is like, oh, what kind of how how much do you want to know about what's going on? Like, should I only show you, should I show you all the rejections? Should I show you um, the kindest rejections? Or should I just show you the absolute, absolute only kindest rejections? Um, I can't remember which one I picked. So she only kind of gives me a little bit of slice of the rejections that I've been getting. Um, but yeah, it's so, it. I wonder if um, if maybe genre is something to do with it as well. Like, um, cause um, Smart Ovens is, yeah, it's a collection of short stories, whereas Rubik, I mean, it's still a collection of short stories, but it's interconnected. And it, I think it, um, this the kind of science fictional kind of sheen of of Rubik yes. is a bit stronger than in than in Smart Oven. So I want, yeah, I want that's making me think. <laughs> I, actually, I want to come back to this idea of short fiction in a second. Sorry, but I have just seen we've got a, another question has come through from Ilana, who is one of our um, our toolkits fiction participants for this year. Thank you, lovely Ilana. Um, she's asked, did you ever feel the need to build a readership through ventures adjacent to your writing, whether that is a blog, an Instagram, an author's website, et cetera? And do you think that's something that emerging emerging writers should do? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, I think I did feel the need, but also um, I should not have felt that way. Like I don't think being on social media um, is something that you should do if you feel uncomfortable with it. Um, yeah, so I think if if I had my time again, like I wouldn't put so much pressure on myself to, um, yeah, to, to, you know, get Twitter and, you know, get all the platforms um, because I find it really overwhelming and like um, it kind of, because I, I mean, I have an Instagram, um, but it's, set to private and um, I've been inconsistent about who I, whose invitations I accept and it stresses me out whenever I get a new one because it's like, oh, um, like I've accepted this other person but should, does that mean I have to accept this one? So like I've created this whole web of, <laughs> of <laughs> rules <laughs> that I can't follow. <laughs> and so um, I think um, it's something that you should only do if you, if you are 100% comfortable with it and that, like you go into knowing like, okay, this is my public profile, this is my author profile and yeah. I'll, I'll I'll keep that open. Um, yeah. I think and what's your experience been? Um, I mean, I'm very online, but I, it's mm. also this weird thing. I think I, I, I kind of, um, God, what's the word? I, it's this kind of double thing where I was, um, I, for instance, I had a Twitter account and an Instagram account before my, my book was acquired and I don't really, tend to use either account even now um for work stuff like I'm quite mm. I'm quite I don't like you know reblog reviews or reblog retweet sorry and I, I've just like exposed myself as a tumblr user <laughs> um like I don't I don't tend to like repost very much I'm trying to get better at it but it doesn't uh it doesn't feel particularly natural to me mm. and I think I still it's not like I've got zillions of Twitter followers. Or like I'm, I'm talking like, you know, I'm Twitter famous. But I <laughs> I do definitely still, I have, I don't know, a couple of thousand and I still kind of, I still talk as though I'm talking to like my best friends or like a, a small, not my best friends, but like a smaller group of people, which um, is probably ill-advised. Um, and I probably need to like rein that in. Um but it's interesting because it's like it has now become this 
professional or like a semi-professional tool, mm. right? Which is like, I do have links to my work on my Twitter, but I'm not really talking about it all that much. And more often than not, it's like, I don't know, like here's a funny duck I saw at the garden. Yeah. <laughs> you know, this is my dog doing something stupid. And like, here's an ugly piece of food that I made. And like, here's me looking, I don't know, stupid in my sports. You know, like it's very... um I don't know it's, it's yeah and it, I, that is like this complex question that I think of a lot in terms of like what we feel and sorry I mean we as readers or the general public feel like we are owed from writers or artists yeah or musicians. for sure yeah and that's a really interesting question as um a thing to think about as well because like I um and it's something that I'm grappling with a lot um especially you know with two books out now and like I I I yeah I worry about this all the time about like how I'm presenting to people and whether I'm cutting too many of my too much of myself off and offering it to, to people and um yeah. yeah what story if I've said one story before on a panel am I obligated to say that again or you know <laughs> like yeah if I've already yeah broached one level of disclosure do I have to keep doing that again or and again and again um so yeah it's 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 a tricky question um and there's also this idea of kind of like branding which i'm really averse to <laughs> like, i i mean we all we all do it but uh i i'm really averse to this idea that you need to like market yourself a, as mm. a as a product and i don't mean that in a, like a precious like i'm an artist way but i mean like i i feel like I want to exist on social media because I enjoy using it for certain I try to moderate the time that I spend on it so not in mm. lockdown very well I will say that syntax <laughs> didn't make sense I'm not doing a good job in lockdown but generally speaking I do find it a, a, a useful tool it can be really overwhelming but I think as I get older um, I'm getting better at learning when to switch off or like take a step back but I also yeah, think sure. that I I'm really uncomfortable with this idea of like and I don't even mean this about me specifically, but when we, you know, like when reviews will sometimes mention an author or a musician's social media presence, and I'm like, I understand how that happens, but it shouldn't, I don't know, it shouldn't be part of the package either for me. Like it's a, I don't know, it's a very mm. strange, I feel like there's probably a whole thesis in that somewhere. Yeah, um, I think... I think it's um I mean if I had to give advice to my to myself when I was kind of yeah when my first book was published it's like um you know don't do anything that you're uncomfortable with like it, none of it's not compulsory you know like you, yes. you've done the hard work you've you've written a book you've gone through the editing process like your your job is done like exactly. I mean it it's it's good if you can engage with all that stuff it's good if you um you know if you can be that gregarious you know person at the writers festival who you know is really warm and engaging and all that but like if if that's not who you are and like i think it's worse to be inauthentic like it's worse to force yourself to do it and um yeah so i think like there are um i mean i'm as grateful as i am to the people who, you know the, the other writers who i met who are like really like you know they they really take you under their wing and show, and like let you hang out with them at writers festivals and stuff like that um like if that's not who you are then there are other ways of being a good literary citizen um, yeah totally i yeah. completely agree yeah I, yeah i think um yeah i i don't know i i i struggle with uh i struggle with like what we expect or or demand of artists and I'm not yes. kids, you, know, but like, you know writers musicians whatever I struggle with that um online because it, it's like sometimes it feels like I don't know if other people get to have like these non-professional outlets where they're just like whoa like look at this I don't know stupid video or like isn't this funny or like I hate this politician um yeah I don't know it's, it's a curious question um yeah sorry, I'm just yeah. looking we have another question that has come in which is oh, wow. um Completely unrelated, but also something that I, I wanted to talk about anyway. Um, what does the day-to-day -day of being a writer look like? Um, <laughs> maybe a COVID version and a before COVID version. But you are in Perth, so I gather things have changed. But there, I mean, I know you're doing, like, online teaching, but I mm -hmm. gather that, it, like, 
You sorry, you tell me. I'm putting words in your mouth. Yeah. Um, well, I think my day to day um, it doesn't remain consistent um, because I've yeah. I've, um, for example, at the moment um, I've I've been teaching online, um, but I'm also um, in, in the month just gone. I, w I had two writers festival appearances that I kind of had to try to prepare for. Um, and, you know, of course, I had to kind of think about ahead to this session that we're in right now. Um, and I'm also uh, reading entries for a short story competition. So um, my day to day at the moment is not a lot of not as definitely not as any any writing. <laughs> um, so it um, but in my I kind of ideal day to day, because um, um, my other job is that I'm a I'm a sessional tutor for Curtin University and most of my and pretty much all my teaching happens online um, through Open Universities Australia. So um, on, a, on an ideal day when I've, you know, I've got a, a short story that I'm working on, um, I'll make sure that the morning is spent on that short story. Like I'll, I'll wake up and I'll take I'll put, take my laptop to bed and I'll make a cup of tea and I'll, and I'll write um, until midday. And I will, I will save, um, you know, checking the discussion board and all marking like for the afternoon. But yeah, I try to prioritize, like, yeah, make sure that my writing gets the best hours. And but, yeah, sometimes. Oh, sorry. Yes, yes. Um, I try to do that, but like I slip up a lot. Like, um, you know, I might when I'm sitting in bed, I might you know check my email, my uni emails, and then there'll be a student query that I kind of feel like, oh, I should get to that, and so I slip up a lot. <laughs> but yeah. um, yeah, it's hard to. It's hard to. Again, I don't want to put words in your mouth. I'm. I have a similar experience, but it is hard to sometimes like give value or or place importance on your own practice, I practice when um, you've got something like teaching or whatever it is, like paying the bills and you're like, well, I should do mm. this because, yes, I care about these students or I care about this client or I care about my job. Yes. But also at the end of the day, that is what that is how I'm paying my bills. And mm. you know, I, yeah, I very much understand that. I think yeah, <laughs> you said you, said you, um, you give your best time Sorry, there's a lovely phrase. Uh, you give your best time to your writing, and you said that was in the morning. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, I'm a morning person as well. But did did you always know that? Have you always been a morning person? Um, no, like I don't know if I'd characterize myself as a morning person per se. Like I um, I I tend to keep I tend to sleep. Sorry, I get I get to bed quite late, and so sometimes I, you know, sometimes I sleep in, or sometimes I can't I can't sleep, so um, I get up early. So it's um, I think it's more that in the morning, like my because my brain is still a little bit foggy, like it's not as critical. <laughs> so um, it's just the best time for me to do all kinds of work, like even um, like marking or responding to student emails. Cause I'm like my kindest self, I suppose, like <laughs> my most forgiving self. So, um, yeah, <laughs> but did I you, just, um, so you mentioned that you're also a morning person. Did you all, always know that about yourself? Yeah. I mean, since I was like a high school student, but I just think, um, I think I might've said that to our toolkits participants already. Maybe not. Um, but this idea of like knowing when you work best in the day mm. sounds really basic, but I feel like for a lot of people, like even for me, like that kind of um, admitting the defeat, I always wanted to not be a morning person because it's really not cool. Like I'm the opposite to you. I can't stay up late because I like not only does my brain not work, I, I'm like I get sleepy. Like I'll be standing at a gig or at a party and like I'm in a very loud uh like you know engaging situation and my whole body is like it's it's bedtime now I mean, <laughs> yeah like a real nonna and so I try I rallied against it for years because I had this idea of like you know what it meant to be a creative was was to burn the <laughs> oil but um by the time I finally worked out that like no actually I'm at my my sharpest in the morning and really my brain isn't doing very much after about four or five in the evening that's when I need to like watch a show or like do some housework or whatever yeah um but that's I can do like admin at that time of night like basic responding to emails um 
Mm. But that's about limit. And when I realised that, it really did change how I approached writing and how I divided up my time. And it seems like such a basic thing, but I wish I had known that when I was younger. Like, mm. yeah. Yeah, and embraced that. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Instead yeah. of being like, oh, I need to be like, I don't know, drinking a glass of whiskey. No, not that I'm sorry, I've never been that kind of writer. Um, another question. <laughs> What are some time, so what are some tips rather for juggling that writing time with, like you said, the time that you have to spend on paying the bills and some hobbies, etc. Oh tips. I think I yeah. <laughs> um I'm I still would like to know that actually. <laughs> I, I don't know if I have any tips because I I struggle with that all the time. Um but I think maybe part of that is, I guess, being forgiving on yourself. Like if you do slip up, like, you know, like I said before, like I try to spend um, my best hours on writing, but sometimes I slip up. But that doesn't mean, you know, I'll throw the whole thing in the bin. Like it was, that was poor plan. You know, like you just got to try again, I think. I don't know if that counts as a tip, but. <laughs> yeah, I think that's um, good. And I'm the same. I feel like I'm, uh, this is very still much a very, very still much you can tell see 637 that's too late for me um <laughs> very much still a work in progress for me but I think mm -hmm. um something I would say is that like looking at writing as a job if you can which is really hard right it's hard for mm -hmm. so many reasons it's hard because it doesn't pay the bills and it's hard because I mean I, I like this is maybe a personal or subjective thing but I um I have a, a strange chip on my shoulder about being like, it's not a useful thing, you know? Like I, <laughs> like if I was like a, a, a nurse or a, a, I don't know, a construction worker, I would, I would potentially be doing things that were kind of contributing something. But sometimes I find it really hard to to justify spending time writing my silly little stories. When, <laughs> you know, they're like, it, it's, it's such a, um, it, it, it seems so meaningless sometimes and then then I think well like I, I don't apply that to anyone else you know I don't mm -hmm. I don't have that standard for my my favorite writers or musicians or visual artists or architects like I'm just stoked that I get to read you know a new I don't know Jennifer Mills book when it comes out or whatever I'm not like what did she spend two years writing that for what a waste of time <laughs> I guess what I'm trying to say is treating your treating your creative practice as a job and affording affording it the same like seriousness as you mm. do a job, which is really hard to do. I'm not I'm not denying that. I'm still learning yeah. how to do it. But carving out time for it and, and I think like what it's kind of similar to what you're saying, giving your best hours or giving it some hours, sometimes that's all you can do. If you have, mm. if you work mornings at a at a daycare center, then you and and you work best in the mornings. That really sucks. Um, and so then it's about maybe, as as Elizabeth said, like being kind to yourself and uh, trying for say you know three nights a week. I don't write three mm. nights a week. To be clear, I would me neither. <laughs> Some some people are like, oh, I have to write every day, or like some people are very disciplined, and I really admire mm -hmm. that. But I also. Yeah. <laughs> want to fly a flag for people who can't do that yeah no absolutely <laughs> yeah. yeah um the other thing I wanted to admit that just occurred to me was that um it's good if you can like um like because I, I just as I mentioned I write in bed and I these days I try to make sure that okay only writing in bed happens like no other work happens in bed um like I, and you know, if I need to answer a uni email or I need to, I'm checking the discussion board. Okay, I'm going to take that to the office or take that to a different room of the house. So yeah. that can kind of help a little bit, like like hygiene or something, like work hygiene. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Actually, I just um, I haven't moved into it yet because of the lockdown, but I just I'm about to start renting a studio for the first time in my life, and um, that sounds it, it actually still feels really crazy and indulgent to me. But I live in this tiny apartment that's like literally like it's been featured on Tiny House, not my apartment. <laughs> but the other ones in the same block has been featured on like Tiny House YouTube or whatever. <laughs> Famously very small, and so everything happens in the same space. And since working from home as well through the pandemic, I found that like. My sleep is really, I'm not a good sleeper anyway, but it's really, really disrupted because like that's my bed and, mm. you know, most nights I will roll off a call at eight o'clock and be like, well, I guess it's dinner time and, you know, it's everything is so compressed. Mm. And so it's like a massive, uh, I'm extremely lucky 
uh, to to be in a position where I can I can look at a studio or something like that. I also got kind of lucky because the guy that I'm going to rent from, um, we're doing a bit of a work arrangement where like I'm going to help him mm. with some writing in exchange for a, a reduced rate. So like a lot of stars have aligned. Um, yeah. But I'm so yeah. looking forward to that, to having that delineation between kind of labour and leisure, which is what you're talking about, like being mm. able to go into another room or a different space. Um, it really helps to kind of formalise, yeah, that idea of like writing as work or writing as distinct from other kinds of work. Yeah, for sure. And just returning to that um, previous question about whether, um, you know, things had changed pre-COVID and post-COVID, I think one yeah. of the things that did change for me was that I couldn't, um, before before COVID, I would sometimes go into the sessional office that's at Curtin and do some of my work there. And that was a, like, yeah, nice kind of removal from, it even like, yeah, it even greater distance from my like creative writing area. So, um, and that's something that kind of, yeah, that didn't, yeah, when we were in lockdown, I, obviously I couldn't do that. And like, I've just got into the habit of working from home now. So yeah, that's one thing that's changed, I think, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and it, I don't know, it's sometimes like we can't always, uh, we can't always change, we can't always like fix these problems, but even yeah. just being aware of them helps you to kind of troubleshoot a little bit. Like, and I wasn't in a financial position to even think about a studio um, six months ago. And so I had to create these these little rules for myself where it was like at the end of the day, of my because I, you know, have a have a job that I do during the day and so it was like a, when I when I log off from that bill paying job I go for a walk even if it's just like around the block but I have to leave my apartment complex and I either like I, I go and I go for a run or I just walk around for a bit and then I come back and then I have to do one other thing whether it's like cooking dinner uh you know the folding laundry talking to a <laughs> friend anything else that doesn't involve a screen and then I'm allowed to start on my writing. And it, it's so stupid, but it made me realise I do have this, like, lizard brain that responds to, uh, to to really basic tricks like that. I mean, <laughs> yeah. but it was the best I could do at the time, you know, between, like, not being able to go to a library because of lockdown and then not yet. Yeah. There are just, mm. like, little – being aware of that stuff, I think, is, like, half the um, – half the equation or half of the solution to the equation. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And yeah, allowing yourself that kind, like just being extending that kind of gentleness towards yourself as well. Yes. Yeah. When you can't, yeah, just, yeah. It's like that saying, um, about, oh, how does it go? Like perfection is the enemy of good or done or something like that. Or yes. Like, yeah. Something like that. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, not holding yourself up to being perfect and just, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Giving it yeah. a go. <laughs> yeah. Like, and that also that idea that like uh, again I'm going to butcher this quote, but that idea that like <laughs> five words on a page is like that idea that something is better than nothing, you know. And I'm yeah, very no, guilty sure. of not adhering to that because I'm such a I'm such an anal like I'm such a neurotic. <laughs> writer. I'm like I can't get it down until it's perfect, but but it is always better to just have if you've got if you, if you've got like shit down, you can kind of fix it yeah. or try to fix it. Whereas if you don't have anything, it's like yeah. Um, actually, I, was th I thought it was funny um, how in the kind of uh, the kind of um, copy for this this session, it, it kind of starts off with like, you know, for centuries, writing has been romanticised and mythologised from the image of the impoverished but impassioned author working away in a creaky garret to the fairy tale story of the mysteriously financially independent writer, I think Carrie Bradshaw in Sex and the City and also every other TV show or film with an author character. And it got me thinking about how the one film that I think actually kind of got that right was um, Step It Up, the Netflix romantic comedy, and there's, like, a the protagonist that's a writer. And, like, there's a really great scene where, it's like, she's, like, moaning to her best friend, like, oh, I'm trying to, I've am trying. i been trying to write this same article for months and, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a terrible writer. And the, the best friend just kind of takes her by the collar and she's like, well, you have to, your problem isn't, like, that you're a bad writer, it's that you're afraid to be a bad writer, that you're afraid to write something bad. Um, <laughs> and, true. yeah, I, just, I was like, oh, my gosh, <laughs> that's so true. Yes. She's like, well, just write a bad article. And, she, and the, the writer's like, yes, I'll just write the shittest article ever. And yeah, it's, yeah, you just, you have to write shit before you can write good. <laughs> exactly. And also, like, look, this isn't true for, uh, in every occasion. Like, this is, I'm, I'm you know, this isn't a, a, a golden rule. But 
so much of the time it is better than what you think it is. Like, yes. Yeah. So much of the time. <laughs> You get something down and you're like, this is the worst thing I've ever written. Like, I'm going backwards. I, you know, I can't believe I, I'm submitting this to this competition. I can't believe I'm letting my editor read this. And then, like, it's just that you get into this weird, or, sorry, you, we, I get into this spiral <laughs> of, like, has self-criticism where it's like, actually, maybe the edits are quite minor and you've just convinced yourself that, what you're doing is is the worst thing in the world and actually you know it's it, it's it's pretty it's pretty good it's pretty close to being there you know it just just needs a little bit of help from an editor yeah for sure um and i think i guess one of the disadvantages to um i guess study writing in university is that because of the assessment deadlines you don't always have that that luxury of space and time like yes. putting the draft away and then coming back to it later yeah. Yeah. Can we talk about that? About mm, um, yeah. Yeah. So you studied creative writing at university, and then yes. did your PhD, which you, you said mm -hmm. was Ruby, and now you teach creative writing. Can you talk yeah. a little bit about like um uh like what any anything you learned or um enjoyed or didn't enjoy from like that the kind of workshopping process, both with peers and and with teachers or, or tutors, professors, I guess. Mm, yeah. Um, let's see. I think, um, well, in my notes, I kind of wrote down the quote. I think it's a pretty common quote, but um, it's often credited to Robert, Robert A. Heinlein. And he said, writing can be learned, but not taught. And I think I find that to be really true. Like, um, like the I, I think it, it's um, it you can't if you if you are studying writing in university you can't come with the expectation that I'm going to to be taught how to write. Um, it's more it's more like um, it's like how you can't make a plant grow. You kind of you can fertilize the soil and you can you know put it in a good position and you can put a stake in it so that it grows like you know straight. But yeah, you can't you know, make it make it grow yourself and I think it's similar writing is very similar like um I think the purpose of um you know uh writing writing courses and in workshops and programs such as toolkits is giving you that environment that rich soil in which to 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 grow um and yeah find out what works for you and yeah I guess and so, so you, I th you don't think that oh sorry Sorry. Yeah, no, you, you go. <laughs> you froze on my end and I thought you would, I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh. I was just going to say, you don't think that studying creative writing formally is uh, indispensable to publishing work or being a good writer or? Mm, not at all. Like it's, it's it. Um, I, I mean, I think it, it really depends on the person. Like it depends on who you are, I guess. Um, like I, I know that I, I benefited from it enormously, but like I, I'm not, yeah, I, I wouldn't presume that that is the best fit for, for, for anyone else. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I do know, like, um, most of my writerly friends I met through university. Um, mm. And I, I think that's the other um, positive thing about um, studying writing um, at university is that you find your people. You find um, the people who are, um, who are kind of at the same same level as you and have the same have, yeah the, their skill set is kind of matched to yours yeah. um and you you find through workshop and you find people that you you gel with and um if you can make friends with those people like you know those are the people who you know years later when you don't you don't have the luxury of having a workshop in class like they're, they're people that you email and be like oh would you mind, do you have time to look at this? And and you also reciprocate, like you're also available to them as well if they if they want a second eye on things. Um, and they're the people who, you know, serve punch at your launch and who, um, yeah, will come to your, your your first panel discussion and, you know, and who will keep you company at the signing table when you're all by yourself there. <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah. Um, and what about yourself? Like, did you study writing at university? Um, I, I did. I studied writing at TAFE, which um, mm. so I did one creative writing class at well, I did. I did a Bachelor of Arts and when I wasn't like majoring in I had done no writing like formally, um, but I had always loved it. And I did one creative writing class on short fiction and um, I 
I enjoyed it, but I felt like um, that particular university and creative writing program was quite academic and I felt mm. like I wanted to do less theory and more writing, writing. So yeah. I um, I enrolled in a program that is now, it kind of doesn't exist anymore, but um, professional writing and editing at RMIT, which um, is, it's, sorry, it still exists. Now it's kind of being university fied a little bit. Now I think it's an mm. associate degree maybe, or maybe it's just a bachelor's. I don't know. Sorry, I'm probably we're gonna stop up. But when I when I <laughs> it was a TAFE program, and I really um, like I, I'm in no way against creative writing programs at university whatsoever. I regularly think about going back and doing more study. Um, yeah, for sure. But for me at that time, TAFE was the best possible thing just because it was focused on. It was very vocational, which is the purpose I understand. But mm -hmm. it was like. Um, it was, you know, I did I did a journalism class and it was like, how do you pitch? How much should you get paid? Mm. What are the questions you should ask about being paid? Like it was this stuff that I never would have learnt at that time at, at, you know, the university course that I was doing because it was, that was much more theory-based and a mm. lot did yeah. workshop, but there was a lot less workshopping. Whereas in TAFE, it was like, um, it was also an older cohort, which I think I needed at the time. Um, mm -hmm. But uh it was incredibly practical and that really appealed to me I've always really struggled with um you know even when I did my arts degree I really struggled with sort of theory-based subjects I, I just like yeah I, I kind of am a, you know, <laughs> good and it, it has its good points and bad points but I'm kind of a pragmatic yeah. person by nature and so being in a course where it was like you show up and you do these things every week and you you know, you write a pitch or you write a screenplay treatment or you you know whatever it was and like those were our assessments they were very like industry specific things and having teachers who were very approachable but also able to be like this is what a royalty breakdown looks like this is what you can ex it was very transparent in this way that I I haven't really found in other mm, yeah places. that sounds really cool <laughs> yeah. um, so I think like for me you know as a baby writer that was really important and it definitely um it was really helpful going into kind of my with my first book being acquired I feel like I um I had like I to, to be clear I was an idiot I was 23 years old and didn't know anything mm -hmm. I still don't know very much but um I feel like I I was lucky to have had that education because mm -hmm. I definitely didn't have like I don't know, like a lit theory background and I couldn't tell you what like, you know, at the time I, I couldn't tell you what like postmodern literature meant, but I, <laughs> I was able to be like, I don't know, I, I think this is fair. I don't think this is fair. I, I do like this editor. I'm not really sure about how this editor is seeing my work. Um, and that was probably like the best thing that could have happened to me at that time. And like mm -hmm. you say, I appreciate that's not, that wouldn't be for everybody and I don't think that you need to study writing per se. I, but I do. I, I think. I think what you said about the kind of community and meeting like-minded people, I mm -hmm. think that's the best possible thing you can get out of it. I, as you were talking, I, I got briefly distracted because my phone lit up with a message from <laughs> my, one of my dearest friends from TAFE, Mel, who actually had a book published this year. Oh, um, great! And like, yeah, that there's there's some of the most uh, enduring friendships that I've I've made as an adult. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> um, we are almost out of time, but I wanted to ask a brief question to, to wrap it up. Um, is there anything you wish you had known when you were starting out or like if you could give one piece of advice other than the social media thing to yeah. yourself, to, to um, a younger Elizabeth Tan, what, what do you think you would want to know? Um. Hmm. Hmm. Sorry. <laughs> um, it, I think it's it would be a kind of more generalized version of the social media thing of like don't do anything you're, you're uncomfortable with. Don't feel that you have to put yourself out there if that's not what you you feel comfortable, you know, doing. Um, and also, I, I guess, um, 
I think I might have already touched on this, but like, um, don't be worried if, um, like, oh, well, I've I, I've been very fortunate, and I've encountered so many kind people um, in, on my journey, um, and like lots of, uh, particularly authors who I guess. Um, you know, they they tell me, oh, I really liked your book, and I feel really awful and guilty because I haven't yet read their book, um, and that that happens I, that happens a lot, um, and I still feel really guilty. But I think one thing that helps um, ameliorate that a little bit is the idea of well, you won't be able to read everybody's work, and you won't be yeah. able to keep as up to date with things as you would like to, um, but you can pay that generosity forward you can um you know re recommend you can buy you, yeah you can recommend a new, a new author's book to to a friend you can um you can retweet their post you can you know there are there are other ways that you can extend that generosity and so yeah like you you'll still feel guilty of yeah your to be red pile that <laughs> is going to crush you but um it it's okay like everyone yeah then like and I think, you know, when I tell someone, oh, I really liked your book, there's no expectation of that they have read my book. Um, and yeah, like, you're when not I, waiting for them to be like, yeah, well, um, Smart Ovens for Lonely People was also really good. Like, it's like <laughs> yeah. you say it for yeah. that response. I, absolutely, yeah. And, like, when I appear on panels um, with other writers, you know, I try to, before I meet them, I try to read their book. But there's no expectation that they're doing the same for my book. Like, and, yeah, it and it's totally fine. So, Yeah. <laughs> No, I, think, I think that's really lovely and I think I don't know that it, it, that is a good place to to end on I think um because it's such a small um fish pond in Australia sometimes it is very I don't know easy for people to feel competitive but it really mm -hmm. I, I don't know I don't want to sound like a Pollyanna here but it really is the case that like one other person's success does not mean absolutely your work is not is not great and I I really do believe that like to, you know there's some shit that gets published as well but um the best thing we can do is kind of um emerging mid-career writers is to support one another and I don't mean that in a like kumbaya let's all hold hands way but I mean if you have uh friends or acquaintances or even people you you don't know who are doing really amazing work um then then champion champion that because it just makes mm -hmm. the whole literary ecosystem stronger it doesn't it doesn't um it's not an indictment on your work that somebody else is doing really well you know it's yeah and, absolutely yeah yeah <laughs> i think that's that's a like that's a nice yeah. um, warm and fuzzy place to finish on yeah <laughs> um thank you to everybody who submitted a question by a um Thank you. There were so many questions. <laughs> um, and thank you, thank you, Elizabeth, for joining us. Um, I'm really grateful. Oh, thank you, thank you for yeah. This was been this has been good. Both <laughs> yeah. um, of Elizabeth's books, um, Smart Ovens for Lonely People and Rubik, are available um, through Brio Publishing. Um, you can find them at your local bookshop, at your local library. Libraries are great. Authors also benefit from library yep. uh, borrowing so if you don't have the dollars to, to spend on a, a brand new book I get it and I have been there many times but um that's why your local library is a beautiful place and other than that, that I think it's a wrap on our um our final live session for this season of toolkits live um so a reminder that this session will be available on youtube as a, a resource in perpetuity and it will be captioned in the coming days. So if you would like to revisit any of tonight's chats, um, you know where to go. Keep an eye on Express Media's social, Ex Express Media's social media. Sorry, I feel like I just had a small, uh, small stroke. Keep an eye on Express Media's social media um, and then newsletter for updates on Toolkit season two, which will open for applications at the end of this month. So yeah, keep your eyes peeled. Um, and other than that, have a, a lovely evening slash afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. <laughs>